January 7, 1978, Richmond, Utah. Heidi Keyes gave birth to her second child. Heidi and her husband, John, had chosen to perform a home birth. The Keyes did not believe in modern science or medicine, and as far as anyone can tell, neither one of them ever saw the inside of a hospital. They would go on to have ten children in total, and none of them would ever receive a vaccination or even a simple checkup. Their second child was a boy, and they named him. Israel. Israel's parents initially brought him up as a fundamentalist Mormon. Him and all his siblings were homeschooled and they learned how to read by memorizing scripture. None of the children had social security numbers or birth certificates. Heidi and John hated the government. When Israel was five years old, they moved to a remote part of Washington state called Colville. John had purchased a plot of land in the backwoods of Washington and he began to build a cabin there. While the cabin was being built, which took many years because John was doing all the work by himself, Heidi and the children lived in tents. They had no electricity, no running water, and no plumbing. The Keyes family would end up becoming reliant on Israel, who filled the role of father figure for his own siblings. He provided the family with food, learned how to braid his sister's hair, and overall, he was the golden child. Along with the move to Washington, the Keyes family also converted to a different denomination of Christianity. They began attending a church called the Ark, which believed in white supremacy. Israel would later describe the church environment as similar to an Amish militia. During their time at the Ark, the Keyes befriended the Cahoe family, including Chevy Cahoe, who would go on to get arrested for his connection to the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995. Israel needed new hobbies to fill his free time with, and the Ark made this easier. Many of the people who attended the church were gun fanatics who taught Israel how to build his own firearms. With this new skill, Israel was able to hunt for his family. He would provide them with deer to keep them fed, but what they never knew, or at least never admitted to knowing, was that Israel wasn't really hunting deer for his family's benefit. He was doing it for his own personal gratification. From a fairly young age, Israel had shown numerous signs of psychopathy. For example, one of his sisters owned a cat that liked to get into the garbage and make a mess. Israel threatened to kill the cat if his sister didn't control it. On a different occasion, Israel tied a cat to a tree and killed it with a revolver. He also enjoyed pastimes such as setting fires in the woods, breaking into people's homes, and stealing guns. This sort of behavior did not go unnoticed. Other children refused to hang out with Israel because they were scared of him. Israel soon realized that he was different from his peers, and this realization only made his tendencies worse. Seeing as his parents didn't believe in things like modern medicine or science, Israel never received therapy or anything else to help him with his mental health. He continued torturing and killing animals, but he became extremely adept at hiding his exploits. Israel was a fast learner and he became a skilled carpenter. According to his family, he could build and fix almost anything. Eventually, the Keyes family relocated yet again, this time to Smyrna, Maine, where they lived in a mostly Amish community. By this point in his life, Israel was fed up with the way his parents treated him and his siblings. He told his parents that he no longer believed in God, which resulted in them evicting him from their home. They commanded their other children to never speak to Israel again. In the summer of either 1997 or 1998, Israel went to a beach on the Deschutes River in Oregon. His plan was not to go swimming with everyone else, however. He waited until he saw a group of girls come floating down the river in tubes. One of the girls was trailing behind the rest, so he pounced on the opportunity. He forced the girl to enter a nearby bathroom at knife point. Israel estimated that the girl was between the ages of 14 and 18. He tied her up in the bathroom and proceeded to sexually assault her. His original plan also included murdering the girl but he lost his nerve at the last second. 
Israel ended up letting the girl go, and for weeks afterwards, he was terrified that he would see something on the news about what he had done. He resolved to never lose his nerve again. For whatever reason, the victim never came forward to report him. In 1998, Israel decided to join the United States Army. It's unclear exactly why he made this decision, but it's likely that it was an act of rebellion against his parents, who despised everything about the government, including the military. Israel passed a rigorous training course and became a mortar specialist. To this day, nobody knows how he was able to enlist in the military without a social security number or birth certificate, but he somehow talked his way in. Israel spent time stationed in Fort Lewis, Washington State, Fort Hood, Texas, and Sinai, Egypt. He never saw combat during his service. The other soldiers around Israel quickly noticed his odd demeanor. He refused to talk about his father in particular, leading many people to believe that he had been abused. Several soldiers remember times when Israel forced animals to fight each other to the death for entertainment. On one occasion, Israel and a group of soldiers got a motel room and hired a prostitute for a night of fun. The prostitute accompanied Israel to a separate room, but she came running out of the room minutes later. Israel attempted to block the door to prevent her from escaping, but she kicked him and ran away. In an interview with the FBI years later, Israel stated that he, quote, threw her around a little bit. I wasn't going to let her run the show. This is another classic sign of psychopathy, a need to establish your dominance, a need for control, especially in sexual situations. Another facet of Israel's military service was his use of various substances. He tried LSD and snorted cocaine, but his favorite substance was always alcohol. Israel developed an incredibly high tolerance to alcohol and spent a lot of time drinking. This would eventually become something that would carry over to his civilian life. However, despite the sheer amount of alcohol he consumed, his abilities were never disrupted. By all accounts, Israel Keyes was a model soldier even a super soldier based on his physical prowess and his proficiency at building his own equipment. For example, Israel constructed his own ghillie suit from scratch, which takes sniper specialists months to learn how to do. It's unclear exactly what Israel's training entailed, but his proficiency in certain tasks was astounding. Anchorage, Alaska, February 1st, 2012. 18-year-old Samantha Koenig was working the closing shift at the coffee kiosk where she was a barista. The kiosk closed at 8 p.m. and Samantha was working alone. She didn't own her own car. She shared a truck with her boyfriend, Duane. The plan was for Duane to pick her up after she finished closing the kiosk. Samantha was popular in her high school and not just amongst the cool kids. She often made an effort to strike up conversations with classmates who seemed lonely or distressed. Samantha may have had a short history with drug use, seeing as her father, James, was connected to the drug trade in Anchorage. James was a truck driver who frequently drove through the seedy neighborhoods of the city. However, there was nothing he wouldn't do for his baby girl. As the night dragged on, Samantha got fewer and fewer customers. The security cameras in the kiosk captured the final moments of her shift. Just before 8 o'clock, a man approached the kiosk and pulled a gun on Samantha. Although the security footage had no audio, the FBI were given a play-by-play -play of the events months later. The man informed Samantha that he was robbing the kiosk. She raised her arms in a sign of surrender and knelt on the floor. After a few minutes, she got up and removed all the money from the cash register, giving it to the man. She then returned to a kneeling position. The man then told Samantha to approach the window with her back facing him which she did, and he tied her hands behind her back with zip ties. After Samantha got away from the window, the man vaulted through the opening into the kiosk. The man escorted Samantha out of the kiosk with her hands still tied behind her back. I'm sure it's no surprise to any of you that the man in the security footage was Israel Keyes. He spent time scouting around his home city of Anchorage, hunting for victims. He had observed Samantha working the kiosk and had learned the closing time of the business he knew he needed to make a quick exit. 
Israel escorted Samantha through the parking lot. By random coincidence, Israel saw a Canon camera lying on the ground. He took it as a good omen, and he reached down to pick it up. Samantha took this distraction as an opportunity, and she bolted. Unfortunately, Israel was faster. He tackled Samantha and threatened to kill her if she tried to run away again. Israel escorted Samantha to the parking lot where he had parked his truck, but there was a problem. Another truck had pulled into the lot and there was a group of people milling around it. Israel knew that this was Samantha's second chance to escape. All she needed to do was scream to the strangers that she was being kidnapped. However, her previous escape attempt had only served to increase her fear. Samantha remained silent, allowing Israel to open the passenger door of his truck and buckle her into the seat with her hands still zip-tied together. In the truck, Israel informed Samantha that he was going to hold her for ransom and she would be safe as long as she complied. She told him that her family wasn't wealthy and he wouldn't be able to get much money out of them, but Israel told her to let him worry about that. At some point during the drive, Israel pulled up to a red light. By pure coincidence, a police cruiser pulled up next to him. Samantha had her third opportunity to escape. If she could just get the cops' attention, Israel's plan would be foiled. Sadly, Samantha was so terrified of Israel that she remained silent. The police cruiser drove off into the night. Israel drove to a park called Lynn Airy. A group of cross-country skiers were packing up and they began making their way towards the parking lot. This was the fourth time Samantha had a chance to escape, but yet again she remained compliant. After the skiers had left, Israel moved Samantha to the back seat and covered her in drop cloths. He had made an even longer chain out of zip ties so that she was still restrained. At this point, Israel realized he had made several mistakes. Samantha's phone was still at the kiosk and he had forgotten to lock the door. This would make it even more obvious to the authorities that someone had taken Samantha against her will. He drove back to the kiosk, which was now completely deserted. He told Samantha that if anything looked out of place when he returned, he wouldn't be happy. He entered the kiosk, took Samantha's phone, and then picked up several zip ties that he had dropped on the floor. Another mistake. He proceeded to tidy up the kiosk to make it look as if Samantha had finished her shift normally. He left the kiosk, but after walking a few feet, he realized that Samantha's keys were still inside. Yet another mistake. He retrieved the keys and left the kiosk for the final time. Samantha had not moved since Israel had left the truck. He began driving away and Samantha told him that she had to use the bathroom. Israel knew that this could just be another escape attempt, but he couldn't allow Samantha to use the bathroom inside his truck. If that happened, her DNA would be all over the back seats. He drove to Earthquake Park, where he tied a length of rope around Samantha's neck and walked her out onto the grass. There were no trees or bushes anywhere nearby, so Samantha was forced to use the bathroom, completely exposed. Israel lit up a cigar and began smoking, and Samantha actually smoked with him. This might seem like an odd detail at first glance, but it actually reveals just how smart Samantha was. By sharing the cigar with Israel, she was trying to make a connection with him. If a kidnapped victim makes a connection with their kidnapper, it becomes more likely that the kidnapper will let them go. After getting back in the truck, Israel realized his gas tank was almost empty. He filled it up and decided to use Samantha's phone to throw the police off his scent. He sent messages to Samantha's boyfriend and boss, making it seem as if Samantha was extremely angry at them. This tactic was designed to make the authorities think Samantha had run away voluntarily. Once he had sent a number of messages, he removed the battery from her phone to avoid being tracked. Then he drove back to his house, Samantha still lying down in a back seat. He told her not to move. Some of his neighbors were still out and about, which created a dangerous situation for him. Israel set up a shed in his backyard. He covered the ground with a tarp and had a radio set up inside, along with two heaters to make it habitable. Israel informed Samantha that he was using a police scanner to listen for any reports about a missing girl, which was true. If she attempted to escape or somehow managed to contact the authorities, he would know. He turned on the radio and began blasting heavy metal at full volume in order to drown out any sound Samantha might make. He gave her a five-gallon bucket to use as both a toilet and a seat. Israel then commanded Samantha to give him her home address and a description of the truck she shared with Duane. She complied and Israel drove to Samantha's house. He stole Samantha's bank card from the truck, but just as he was locking up, a man came out of the house and saw him. That man was Duane. Both men stood completely still, staring at each other. All of a sudden, Duane turned and walked back inside the house. Israel ran back to the car and drove to his house. He forced Samantha to give him the PIN number for her bank account, which turned out to only have 94 cents. 
The events directly following this are not entirely clear, but investigators have been able to draw a few conclusions. At some point after returning to his house, Israel Samantha twice. Once he was done, he stabbed her once below the right shoulder blade and then proceeded to strangle her. After this whole ordeal, Israel had to call a cab in order to get to the airport. He was taking his girlfriend, Kimberly, and his daughter on a cruise vacation. He left Samantha's body in the shed behind his house, not concerned about it being discovered. When he returned from the vacation, he waited for a day when his daughter would be in school. Kimberly was traveling in the lower 48 still. Israel wrapped up Samantha's body and took apart the inside of the shed. He burned everything Samantha had touched and hung her body up. He proceeded to have sex with the corpse, which had not gone into rigor mortis yet. The next phase of the murder was now underway. Israel wanted to create a ransom note. He purchased a Polaroid camera and a roll of film. However, Samantha's body clearly did not look alive. He began applying makeup to her face in order to create the illusion of life. He also braided her hair. Finally, he snapped a picture in which she was holding up her head. He typed out the ransom note with latex gloves on and put the note and the Polaroid in a Ziploc bag. He attached this package to the community board at Connors Bog Park. Israel then used Samantha's phone to send a message to Duane, telling him about the package at the park. The police arrived soon after and confiscated the ransom note. Israel dismembered Samantha's body and chose a location to dump the remains. He settled on Matanuska Lake. Israel made several trips to the lake under the guise of ice fishing. He cut a large hole in the ice, then dropped Samantha's remains into the water with weights attached. The whole process took multiple days. On the first day, he stopped the process in order to attend a parent-teacher conference at his daughter's school. He remained calm and collected during the conference, the teacher having no idea that the man she was speaking with was currently in the process of disposing of a dead body. The investigators on Samantha's missing persons case had analyzed the ransom note and Polaroid. They were also waiting to see if Samantha's bank card would be used, which was something they could track. At this point in the investigation, the detectives still suspected James Koenig of kidnapping his own daughter. When they went to his house to question him, he had refused to let them inside. They ended up obtaining a search warrant and they discovered that James was growing large amounts of marijuana in his home. James had set up a donation page immediately following Samantha's disappearance and it had gotten roughly $30,000. There were rumors that James was using the money for himself, which the investigators found suspicious. On February 29th, James deposited $5,000 into Samantha's account under the supervision of the FBI. They watched as someone used an ATM in Anchorage to try to withdraw $600 from the account. Most ATMs limit daily withdrawals to $500. Less than two hours after the first failed attempt, Samantha's card was used at a different ATM in Anchorage, this time for a $500 withdrawal. James Koenig was now the number one suspect due to the withdrawals being made from within Anchorage. However, this would soon change. On March 7th, Samantha's card was used at a small bank in Arizona. James was still in Anchorage, meaning he either had an accomplice or he was innocent. The next time the card was used was in New Mexico. Israel was moving east on Interstate 10. The authorities were able to deduce that he was driving a rental car, specifically a white Ford Focus, the most popular make and model for rental cars in the United States at the time. Local police were notified about the suspect's movements across the south. Finally, a white Ford Focus was spotted at a Quality Inn in Texas. Having no legal justification to search the vehicle or apprehend the driver yet, the police waited and watched. Their plan was to watch the driver leave the Quality Inn and follow them, looking for any possible excuse to pull them over. After the Ford Focus left the Quality Inn, it pulled up to a red light. When the light turned green, the Ford Focus accelerated to 57 miles per hour in a 55 zone. A Texas Ranger pulled the vehicle over, and just like that, Israel Keys was busted. Of course, it wasn't as quick as that. The authorities took note of his Alaska driver's license and a roll of cash in the car that was stained with red dye. The red dye suggested a bank robbery. A pair of shoes in the vehicle also matched the shoes from security camera footage the FBI had pulled in the case. It wasn't much, but they knew they had the right guy. It's unclear exactly why the police were able to arrest Israel, but once they made that decision, they were legally allowed to search the car and his wallet. They found Samantha's ATM card in his wallet and her phone with the SIM card and battery removed in the trunk. There was no doubt in their minds now. This was the kidnapper.
the FBI was beginning their preparations to interview Israel Keyes. His name meant absolutely nothing to them. He had no criminal record and didn't seem to be connected to Samantha in any way. The murder of complete strangers is extremely uncommon, and FBI agents were coming to the chilling conclusion that if their suspect truly had no connection to Samantha, he must have been a serial killer. And if that was the case, had he killed others before Samantha? If so, how many? These were all questions they were determined to get the answers to, but planning out the initial interview was crucial. They knew that Israel was intelligent and ruthless, so any small mistake during the interview could be used to his advantage. The FBI needed its best and brightest to handle this delicate operation. At first, Israel denied any involvement in Samantha's disappearance. This was frustrating to the authorities, who didn't actually have any real evidence of his involvement. However, on March 30th of 2012, Israel was finally ready to talk. He had two demands before he would say anything. First, he wanted the death penalty off the table. Second, he wanted the media to get as little information as possible. This made things more difficult, but the agents continued their planning. They wrote up a script designed to make Israel believe they had more evidence than they actually did. This script was approved by everyone involved, but one last curveball would be thrown their way. Kevin Feldis was a prosecutor who worked for the U.S. Attorney's Office. Feldis informed the FBI that the interviews would all be performed at the Attorney's Office rather than at the FBI offices, and he himself would be leading the charge. This was downright shocking. Prosecutors never interview suspects. While investigators are legally allowed to lie during interviews, prosecutors don't have that ability. Furthermore, Feldis had no interrogation training or experience. Nobody who was on the case wanted Feldis to be involved, but nobody wanted to get on his bad side either. They agreed to let him lead the interviews. Israel confessed to the kidnapping of Samantha Koenig, but he informed the agents and Feldis that there were certain details he didn't want to share with so many people present. Those details revolved around how he had taken her life. In other words, the FBI needed to remove some of the people from the interview in order to get the full story, but Feldis refused to leave. Israel eventually gave the full story, but it took much longer than it could have. An FBI dive team was contacted, and they were able to retrieve Samantha's remains from Matanuska Lake. Israel had been telling the truth. However, this was far from the end. During his interview, Israel had said, quote, I've got lots more stories to tell. This chilling message was clearly a hint that Israel had murdered more people than Samantha. The FBI's new order of business was to get him to confess to his other crimes. They began researching Israel Keys to see if they could dig up anything useful about his life. As it turns out, he owned a construction company back in Anchorage. The FBI ended up receiving numerous tips from customers of the company. One person remembered hiring Israel to do some work on her home. At one point, she caught him giving her a very unsettling look. She was outright disturbed, but brushed it off as a misunderstanding. Another former customer reported having hired Israel because he had seemed completely innocent during their first meeting, but she was relieved when he finished the job. The FBI searched Israel's house and recovered Kimberly's laptop. They didn't expect to find anything of value on her device, seeing as Israel had already disposed of his own computer by the time he was arrested. However, Kimberly's laptop was full to the brim of pictures of missing persons, including Samantha Koenig. There were no overarching characteristics amongst these people. They were of all different races, men and women, young and old, some who looked wealthy and others who looked like drug addicts and sex workers. The investigators were dead set on getting another confession. At this point, they were positive Israel had more victims that they simply didn't know about yet. They sat down for another interview with him, and Feldis took off running the wrong way. He attempted to threaten Israel, which completely backfired. Israel began speaking with utter contempt for Feldis, who clearly had no idea what he was doing. After an exchange in which Israel essentially taunted Feldis directly to his face, he stated that he had one more demand before he confessed to anything else. He wanted an execution date. This was a total shock to the investigators. Initially, Israel had demanded that the death penalty be taken off the table, but now he was demanding the exact opposite. In exchange for the death penalty, Israel said he was willing to give the FBI two bodies and a name. Bill and Lorraine Courier it was June 7, 2011, Essex, Vermont. Israel was taking a trip to visit his brothers in Maine, but he flew from Anchorage to Seattle, then to Chicago, where he rented a car and drove east, stopping in Indiana and then finally Vermont. On the night in question, 
Israel retrieved his kill kit. You see, several years before, he had buried a five-gallon bucket somewhere in Vermont. This bucket was filled with zip ties, guns, silencers, ammunition, duct tape, and various other items he could use during a murder. Israel originally staked out an apartment complex and waited for a victim, but he missed his opportunity and had to start over somewhere else. Just after midnight, Israel found a house that looked promising. There were no dogs or kids. He claimed that the one thing he would never do was kill children, although the FBI did not believe him. Israel cut the phone line and found a window that had an air conditioning unit installed. That must have been the master bedroom. He waited in the backyard, observing the next door neighbor routinely walking outside to smoke. This neighbor had motion activated lights on his house, so Israel knew he couldn't go anywhere in that direction. When the neighbor finally appeared to be done smoking for the night, Israel removed the ventilation fan from the garage window and climbed inside. He took a crowbar from the garage and found the sliding door that led to the kitchen. It was locked, so he broke one of the window panes and unlocked the door. He quickly made his way to the master bedroom and woke the couriers up, holding a gun to their heads. He zip-tied the couple's hands behind their backs and gathered as many valuables as he could. At one point, Israel came across a military insignia called the Electric Strawberry. This meant that Bill Courier had served in the same unit as Israel himself, by pure coincidence. Of course, this wasn't enough to deter him. He loaded the couple into their own car, a green Saturn sedan. Israel told the couriers that he would bring them to a drop house in order to hold them for ransom, and once he had collected the money, he would let them go. He drove to an abandoned farmhouse and took Bill to the basement, where he strapped him to a stool. Then he went outside to bring Lorraine in, but she was already standing up outside the car. When she saw Israel coming towards her, she tried to run, but he was faster. He tackled her and brought her inside, where he tied her to a bed and fastened a rope around her neck. She fought back the entire time while her husband screamed from the basement. Israel went back to the basement, but he found that Bill was fighting back much harder than he had anticipated. Bill was actually managing to shove him around a bit, which was completely different from the total fear he wanted. He hit Bill over the head with a shovel, but even after that, Bill refused to go down. He had to use the shovel at least one more time to make Bill fall down. Israel then left the basement, but realized that a propane stove which he had brought with him had fallen through the floor. He was terrified that the house would catch fire, so he fixed his mistake and then ran through his options. He retrieved a 22 caliber pistol with a silencer attached and went back to the basement, where Bill had somehow gotten back on his feet and was yelling again. The resilience of the couriers in the face of pure evil was incredible. Unfortunately, this only made Israel angrier. He shot Bill multiple times all over his body, but Bill was miraculously still standing. Of course, this didn't last long, and Bill eventually collapsed. Israel proceeded to cut Lorraine's clothes off her body and rip her twice. If there's any small consolation to take from this horrific story, it's that Bill and Lorraine had both emasculated Israel. Their resilience and determination to fight back had made him feel as if he was losing control, which was the exact opposite of what he wanted. He eventually brought Lorraine down to the basement and strangled her. He then placed their bodies in trash bags and left them in the corner of the basement. Israel wasn't worried about disposing of them. The farmhouse was old and decrepit, which meant that whoever purchased it would most likely tear it down or burn it, removing the evidence of his atrocities for him. After leaving the house, he drove to his rental car, then finished his road trip to Maine. This story left the investigators speechless. Israel's modus operandi was becoming clear, and it was downright terrifying. He would choose a victim at random, someone he had never met before, and bring them to a secondary location. From there, he would sexually assault the victim twice, then murder them, and finally, he would put hundreds, if not thousands, of miles between himself and the crime scene. It was clear that Israel was an expert in committing murder and getting away with it. The lingering question was, how many times had he done this in total? There's a lot more information about this case that you can find online if you want to. I covered the two most gruesome crimes that Israel Keyes committed, and I only touched on his interviews briefly. He committed a string of bank robberies as well, and he had plans to murder future victims inside churches. 
However, the full extent of his crimes will never be known for certain. On December 1st of 2012, Israel Keyes used a razor blade to commit suicide. The FBI had specifically told the prison warden not to allow Israel to have a razor blade, but someone had given him one anyway. Before he died, Israel drew 12 skulls on the wall of his cell with his own blood. Under the skulls, he wrote the caption, We are one. There has been some speculation about what this could mean. The leading theory is that one of the skulls represents Israel himself and the 11 others represent his victims. Of course, without any confirmation on how many people he killed in total, this theory is unproven. Israel Keys is suspected in the disappearances of Lauren Spearer from Bloomington, Indiana, Alexis Patterson from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Julie Marie Harris from Colville, Washington, Cassandra and Marlene Emerson, also from Colville, Washington, the Lewis County Jane Doe from Morton, Washington, Deborah Feldman from Hackensack, New Jersey, Madison Scott from Vanderhoof, British Columbia, and James Lamar Tidwell Jr. from Mount Enterprise, Texas. Additionally, Israel is a suspect in the Boca Raton serial murders. The authorities strongly suspect that the Boca Raton serial killer was actually Israel Keys. The Boca Raton serial killer was responsible for the deaths of Randy Ann Melitz Gorenberg, Nancy Bacicchio, and Joey Bacicchio Hauser. One final note I'll leave you with is this. During the investigation, the FBI discovered that Israel Keys had traveled to Mexico on numerous occasions in order to receive several elective surgeries. One of these surgeries was a gastric bypass, which reduces your appetite. The other surgeries are unknown. However, based on the fact that he received a gastric bypass surgery, it seems highly likely that Israel Keys was transforming his body into the ideal serial killer. Put it this way, if Israel's appetite was drastically reduced, he could commit his crimes and drive extremely long distances without having to stop for food. This would allow him to avoid security cameras at restaurants and grocery stores. Furthermore, the FBI suspects that the surgeries they haven't identified were designed to limit the amount of DNA Israel could leave behind at crime scenes. For example, there are procedures that can modify fingerprints, remove body hair, and reduce the production of sweat. If the authorities are correct in their theory, then Israel Keys was literally using surgery to transform himself into the alpha serial killer. In the book American Predator, Maureen Callahan makes the point that if a human as atrocious, despicable, and ruthless as Israel Keys can exist, more people like him will exist again in the future. Let's just hope that these people aren't as smart or meticulous as Israel Keys. <laughs>